Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. The courtroom was silent as the witness seated herself in the chair. The witness, a young Filipino nurse named Corazon Amaral, was just 4'11". But despite her diminutive stature, she sat tall in her chair, ready to answer any question about the events that took place on July 13, 1966, a night that was undoubtedly the most traumatic of her life. Corazon, also known as Cora, was the sole survivor of and witness to a massacre that killed eight of her roommates and fellow student nurses. The prosecutor and law enforcement were worried that Cora would not be able to testify, that the shock and trauma of that night would incapacitate her, especially with the attacker watching her from the defense table. They could not have been more wrong. The nurse would not be so easily intimidated. After all, she was living some 8,000 miles away from her home country. Shortly after the direct examination began, Cora recalled her first encounter with the attacker. After hearing a knock at the door, she opened it, and a man, all dressed in black, pointed a gun at her. The prosecutor asked if she saw that man in court. After Cora said yes, she was instructed to step down from the witness stand and identify the man. Cora stood up and walked quietly towards the defense table. She looked at the three men sitting there, the defendant and his two attorneys. The nurse got within inches of the defendant and pointed her finger directly at his forehead. In a clear voice that portrayed no signs of doubt or timidity, Cora stated, this is the man. That man was Richard Speck. And because of Corazon Amaral, his victims would get the justice they deserved. Today, Hawaii is renowned as America's Pacific Island paradise, but its journey from independent kingdom to U.S. state was fraught with power struggles, controversy, and violence. Hi, I'm Lindsey Graham, the host of Wondery's podcast, American History Tellers. We take you to the events, times, and people that shaped America and Americans, our values, our struggles, and our dreams. In our latest series, we trace the turbulent history of Hawaii From the 1893 coup that deposed its queen to the 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor that triggered America's entry into World War II. Follow American History Tellers wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. Hi, Cold Case Files fans. We have some exciting news for you. Brand new episodes of Cold Case Files are dropping in your feed, and I'm your new host, Paula Barros. I'm a Cold Case Files super fan, true crime aficionado, and I love telling stories with unbelievable twists and turns. And this season of Cold Case Files has all of that and more. I want to die. I don't want to die. I want to die. Her cause of death was strangulation. Lying face down on the bed. She was in a pretty advanced state of decomposition. A little bit of bloody froth had come from Deborah's mouth. He panicked and decided he was getting rid of the body. I saw danger in everything. So get ready. You don't want to miss what this season has in store. New episodes of Cold Case Files drop every Tuesday. Subscribe to Cold Case Files wherever you listen to podcasts. From Wondery and Tree Fort, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the second season of Killer Psyche.
I've spent five decades studying people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed lots of murderers, including serial killers. And the question of why they did it is what I get asked time and time again. It is difficult to get a satisfying answer without diving deep into their mindsets. So that's what we're doing. And I will give you my best analysis in this series of what made them do what they did. This episode is Richard Speck, The Chicago Nurse Massacre. July 13, 1966, started out as an ordinary weekday for the eight roommates of 2319 East 100th Street in Southside Chicago. The townhouse was one of the dorms for the South Chicago Community Nursing School, and 2319 housed five American student nurses and three Filipino exchange nurses. The women were enjoying the last few weeks of nursing school before they graduated. Three of the women were taking the day off, while the rest went to the hospital to begin their morning shift. After work, the Filipino women gathered together to cook their native cuisine, a tradition that helped them quell their feelings of homesickness. After dinner, they took a nap until about six, then spent the rest of their night watching TV, writing letters, and doing laundry. By 10.30, the majority of the household was asleep, except for two who were out with friends and one who was on a date. With doors locked and lights off, the household began to settle down, and within moments, most were asleep. Then, around 11 p.m., 24-year-old Richard Speck was wrapping up a night of heavy drinking. He approached the back entrance of the two-story townhouse and removed the first-floor kitchen window screen and let himself inside. He quietly walked upstairs and knocked on the bedroom door where 23-year-old nursing student Corazon Amaral and her roommate were asleep. They opened the door to see Speck pointing a gun at them. He ordered the two women into a larger bedroom where their four other roommates were asleep in bunk beds. Threatening them with a knife and a gun... Speck made all six women sit down on the floor. He calmly told them he just needed money to travel to New Orleans. The nurses gathered all the money they had, about $35, and gave it to him. Speck then tore up bed sheets and bound each woman's wrists behind their backs. About 11.20 p.m., While the nurses were being held in the master bedroom upstairs, 22-year-old Gloria Davy returned from her date and entered the first floor. She used the phone to call her house mother to check in. Speck confronted her as soon as she opened the door and made her join the others. During this time, two more women returned to the house after a night out. When they encountered the intruder, they tried to run, but they too were corralled by Richard at gunpoint and tied up with the rest of the nurses. Over the next five hours, Richard Speck led the nurses one by one out of the bedroom in intervals of about 20 to 45 minutes. The nurses did not scream as they were led out of the room but Corazon and Amaral would later say that after Speck took them away, she could hear their muffled cries and then the sound of water running in the bathroom. In the main bedroom, the women tried to decide what to do. The Filipina nurses wanted to fight the man and try to escape. The American nurses disagreed. They thought that the man did not seem crazy and believed that if they remained calm and complied, they would be unharmed. 
as the number of nurses in the room slowly dwindled, Cora rolled under one of the bunk beds. She stayed motionless as Richard Speck took each nurse away, one by one. Unbeknownst to the women, Richard was marching each of them into separate rooms and killing them. When he got to Gloria Davy, Richard was gone much longer than the others. Gloria was intoxicated from her night out and had fallen asleep on the bunk above where Cora was hiding. Richard raped Gloria on that bed and then took her downstairs and killed her. She was the only one that was later found to have been raped. Cora stayed under the bed, watching as Speck came in and searched through the nurse's handbags. He was not looking for Cora. Police believe Speck had lost track of how many women had been in the house and did not realize she was still alive. After Richard left, Cora stayed hidden. She was terrified to leave her hiding spot. At 5 a.m., she heard an alarm go off. By 6 a.m., she no longer heard any sounds in the townhouse and finally crawled out from under the bed and freed her hands. As she left the bedroom, Cora encountered a grisly scene. The bodies of seven of her fellow nurses were spread out in different rooms. The majority of them were nude, and all of them were murdered. Some had been stabbed and others strangled, and some of the victims were both. Cora did not go downstairs where she would have discovered the nude body of Gloria Davy on the living room sofa, also strangled and stabbed. Overwhelmed with horror, Cora ran back to the bedroom pushed out the window screen and crawled out onto the wide ledge over the front door. She then began to scream for five minutes straight. They're all dead. They are all dead. My friends are all dead. Oh God, I am the only one alive. One of the nurses next door heard Cora's screams and rushed to her. But as soon as she entered and saw the horrific scene, she quickly ran and got the house mother from next door. The neighbor went back inside and gently led a sobbing Cora outside while the house mother called the hospital asking for help. They were able to flag down a patrol car that happened to be passing by. The officer immediately entered the townhouse and then called for backup when he saw what had happened. Cora gave a description to the officer of the killer, a six foot one white male, about 160 pounds, with a pock-marked face. She described his distinct tattoos on his arms. In particular, one of them said, born to raise hell. The manhunt began. Over 60 Chicago homicide and burglary detective units canvassed the neighborhood. The attendant at a nearby gas station told them that two days before the murder, a young sailor looking for a job asked to leave his suitcases at the station while he looked for a rooming house. The sailor returned the next morning and claimed his suitcases. With that information, the detectives visited the National Maritime Union Hall and inquired about the unknown sailor. The detectives learned that a man matching the description that Cora had provided had applied for a job that Monday, July 11th. The man had given the name Richard Franklin Speck, a fictitious address, and a small photo. After the murders, Richard Speck did not change his normal behavior. 
when he fled the nurse's townhouse, he checked into a hotel about 17 miles away from the crime scene. He began drinking early that morning and traveled from bar to bar until hiring a sex worker and going back to his hotel. The next morning, July 15th, the sex worker told the front desk that Richard had a loaded gun in his room. The attendant called the police. The extended Chicago police force had still not been told the name of the suspected killer. So when the officer showed up and Richard told them his real name, they did not realize that he was involved in the case. So after confiscating the weapon, the police left. Meanwhile, Cora was shown a lineup of 188 photos. She immediately picked out Richard Speck. By this time, the higher-ranking officers knew Richard Speck's name from the burglary unit's inquiry at the Union Hall. Using the Dallas police records and the FBI record cards from Washington, D.C., the Chicago Crime Lab matched Speck's prints to the crime scene. On Friday evening, a nationwide manhunt began, and Speck became the most wanted man in the country. He was placed at the top of the FBI's most wanted fugitives list. Detectives traced Speck's trail up to the Raleigh Hotel but Richard had already moved to a hotel on Skid Row. The next day, police had released Speck's photo and description to the media, including the detail about his born-to-raise-hell tattoo. Knowing that the police were closing in on him, Speck attempted suicide in his room at the hotel. The man in the room next door heard him banging around and opened his door to find Speck bleeding heavily from his left elbow. Richard had slashed a vein in his left arm and his right wrist with a broken wine bottle. The neighbor alerted the front desk, who in turn called the police. After arriving at the emergency room, a surgical resident attending to him thought he looked familiar. He asked one of the nurses to get the newspaper he had read that morning. The story specifically cited the Born to Raise Hell tattoo on the killer. Though Richard's arm was covered with blood, the doctor wiped it away and saw the words Born to Raise Hell. At that point, he sedated his patient and called the police. After the surgery, cardiologists diagnosed him with pericarditis, a swelling and irritation of the thin, sac-like tissue surrounding the heart. It is a very serious condition, so Speck remained in the hospital another week. On Tuesday, July 19, 1966, Cora was disguised as one of the nurses on the floor and sent in to identify Richard. She confirmed that the patient in that bed was the murderer, and that was the final confirmation that the police needed. Richard Speck was then formally charged with murder. Richard Speck was born in Kirkwood, Illinois, on December 6, 1941. The seventh of eight children, his father worked as a manual laborer. Richard and his sister, the eighth child in the family, were much younger than the rest of their brothers and sisters. When Richard was only six years old, his father died of a heart attack. This devastated Richard, who was very close to his father. Three years later, his mother Mary wed Carl Lindbergh, 
a traveling insurance salesman she met on a train. Her choice of husband was considered odd since Mary was very religious. Her new mate had a criminal record that went back 25 years, not to mention he was also an alcoholic and Mary abhorred any type of alcohol consumption. That same year, Richard and his younger sister moved to Texas with their mother and her new husband. This was the first of 12 moves the family would make in six years. Richard was not a good student. He needed eyeglasses to see, but refused to wear them because he did not like the way he looked in them. But school was the least of Richard's problems at that time. His stepfather, Carl, was extremely abusive, both physically and verbally. He often told Richard that he hated him and that he was worthless. Carl also refused to adopt him. If you have listened to Killer Psyche before, you know the effects an abusive home life can have on a developing mind. A majority of the killers we have examined emulate their childhood abusers. Dr. Elizabeth Gershaw, a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, examined the association between parental physical punishment and its effects on adulthood. She found that, quote, in childhood, physical punishment was positively associated with aggression, delinquent and antisocial behavior, and being the victim of physical abuse. Some of the major trends showed physical abuse led to greater impulsiveness and less self-control, increased antisocial behavior as a child and young adult, more drug abuse and violence toward others, and a tendency to perpetrate more crimes as an adult. In an article in Psychology Today, Dr. Paul Hollinger writes about why physical punishment is so damaging. He believes the affect theory explains it. Quote, physical punishment elicits intense and toxic negative effects, fear, distress, anger, shame, and disgust. In other words, physical punishment causes precisely the feelings one does not want the negative affects, rather than the feelings one does want, the positive affects of interest and enjoyment. Richard was very quiet, and he found it tough to make friends. He suffered from terrible acne and hated being stared at. In class, he tried not to participate because he did not want to draw any attention to himself. At the age of 13, Richard broke into Carl's liquor cabinet and had his first taste of whiskey. He began to emulate his stepfather's drunken, violent behavior and drink every day. Around this time, he was arrested for trespassing, the first of many misdemeanor charges he would incur. The effect that alcohol has on a growing brain is profound. According to Sandra Amont, neuroscientist and co-author of the book Welcome to Your Child's Brain, one of the things that adolescent drug or alcohol use causes is problems with prefrontal cortex function. So somebody who has had an unstable home life is more likely to have trouble with planning and organizing behavior and with inhibiting impulses, including violent impulses, than somebody who has had a stable life. When Richard failed eighth grade, he was forced to repeat it. His teacher at the time said, quote, he seemed sort of lost. It didn't seem as though he knew what was going on. I don't think I ever saw him smile. I wasn't able to teach him anything. I don't think anybody was able to get through to him. 
He seemed to be in a fog. When we consider his horrible, chaotic home life and drug and alcohol abuse, it makes sense that he was in a fog. His brain at this point was damaged. After failing every class in high school, he dropped out of the age at 16. That's not surprising either. Why would somebody continue to attempt to achieve something they had failed miserably at for years? And the law in Illinois at the time said a kid only had to be in school until they were 16. I can't imagine any part of high school was fun for Richard Speck. After leaving school, Richard worked menial jobs and hung out with older boys and men. He spent most of his time drinking and utilizing sex workers. Richard reportedly sustained multiple head injuries during his youth, which possibly led to traumatic brain injury, or TBI. Since we've covered this extensively on some of our recent episodes, I will just reiterate that TBI can cause mood instability and erratic behavior. And while this may have contributed to his future crimes, it certainly was not at the root of his problems. During his time in Dallas, Richard was arrested 41 times for various crimes, from check forgery to robbery to assault. Usually, those assaults were on women. For these crimes, he spent almost two years in the penitentiary. In October of 1961, Richard met 15-year-old Shirley Malone at the Texas State Fair. After only dating for three weeks, Shirley became pregnant. In January of 1962, they got married and moved in with Shirley's mother. But that did not stop Richard from acting out. In fact, it encouraged him. Richard would not be around when his daughter was born because he was serving a 22-day jail sentence for disturbing the peace. This was not his only legal trouble. In 1962, he was arrested at a major theater in Dallas. The manager there said, quote, he was trying to fight all the men and hug all the women. Richard was tattooed several times while he was in jail. It was there he received the Born to Raise Hell tattoo that would play a key role in his arrest. Not surprisingly, Richard was unable to keep a steady job. His longest employment was at a 7-Up bottling company who eventually fired him for stealing another employee's paycheck and cashing it. The company reported that Richard was, quote, careless, troublesome, and yet was hardworking. We could not rehire him. He was dishonest. Lying was something Richard did well and often. In the book, The Crime of the Century, Richard Speck and the Murders That Shocked a Nation, authors Dennis Brio and William Martin state, and I quote, lying was a Speck specialty. He had an uncanny ability to give the events of his life a fictional twist that would keep him out of danger. And although his formal IQ tested at only 90, which is barely low normal for an American adult, his criminal skills were much more highly developed. He had the natural gifts of animal cunning and charm. Speck's secret weapons were his gentle eyes and soft-spoken Southern drawl, a disarming combination that put his male rivals at ease and his female victims off guard. That charm was not present when Richard dealt with his mother-in-law and wife. With them, he was violent and cruel, much like his relationship with his stepfather. When Shirley was pregnant, her mother mentioned that 
Richard would park in the driveway and make out with other women in his car while Shirley sat on the porch and watched. He taunted Shirley as she cried and laughed at her pain. Richard was also physically abusive to her and eventually to his daughter. He would hit them, one time going so far as throwing a knife at Shirley, which hit her in the leg. Whether drunk or sober, Richard beat them. According to the World Health Organization, alcohol consumption is associated with aggressive behavior more closely than the use of any other psychotropic. And Richard's alcoholism was definitely a problem. His probation officer had once described him like this, quote, when Speck is drinking, he will fight or threaten anybody as long as he has a knife or a gun. When he's sober or unarmed, he couldn't face down a mouse. However, just as we cannot blame TBI solely for Richard's behavior, we should not blame alcohol either. Richard forced Shirley to have sex with him four to five times a day. As if all that were not enough, he also tormented Shirley's mother. Richard would take a picture of his mother-in-law in a swimsuit to a bar and hand out her phone number. She would receive dozens of unwanted phone calls for dates. It was not unusual for Richard to threaten her with guns or knives and threaten to kill her. However, one time when Richard tried to threaten her with a knife, she turned the tables on him. Shirley's mother picked up a two-by-four and told him that she was going to make him, quote, eat that knife. Of course, Richard turned and ran away. Shirley and her mother had had enough. In January of 1966, Shirley filed for divorce and Richard did not contest it. In the time between his separation and divorce, Richard's mother called the bartender at his local pub, a single mother with three children named Nancy Sims. His mother asked Nancy if Richard could move in with her. Nancy agreed. She was an ex-wrestler and was not afraid of Richard. Plus, she needed someone to watch her children while she was working. If that makes your skin crawl, as it does mine, Richard was supposedly great with her kids, but not with Nancy's ex-husband. Although Nancy and Richard's relationship was platonic, Richard was very threatened by her ex-husband and often fought with him. Nancy later said that when Richard would be sober for three or four days, he would be very kind. But once he started to drink, he could not stop. He would become aggressive and belligerent. Quote, Speck would do stupid things to hurt other people and then would be sorry afterwards. He was always sorry afterwards, but while he might give a damn about what he had done, he always knew exactly what he was doing while he was doing it. Speck thought that he did not have to work or face consequences because he believed his mother would always give him money and take care of him and bail him out of trouble. The part of that story that is shocking to me is also the part that confirms what Nancy is saying. Richard's mother called Nancy to ask if her son, her 29-year-old son, could stay with Nancy. His mother and sister were devoted to him, and his mother was quick to blame everyone and everything for Richard's actions, except for Richard himself. Because there was a warrant out for his arrest for burglarizing a grocery store and stealing over 70 cartons of cigarettes, Richard fled to Chicago to stay with his older brothers and sisters and some friends. He would then return to his hometown of Monmouth, Illinois. Unaware of Richard's legal troubles, 
His brother helped him get a job sanding plasterboard. On March 16, 1966, Richard and Shirley's divorce was finalized. Richard became irate when he found out that Shirley remarried just two days later. The news spurred another round of violent behavior. Richard was caught stealing from a 65-year-old woman in Monmouth when she came home unexpectedly and caught him red-handed. He brandished a knife, blindfolded, and raped her. Just six days after that, a 32-year-old barmaid went missing, and four days later, her body was discovered in a hog house that Richard had been building. Her liver had been ruptured as a result of a blow to her abdomen. This time, however, there was no evidence of rape. Because her body was found where Richard had been working, the police told him not to leave town. But of course, he left immediately and went back to Chicago. When police searched his room, they found the stolen property of the 65-year-old rape victim as well as two other burglaries. Back in Chicago, Richard wove a fantastical tale about having to leave Monmouth because he refused to sell drugs for the local crime syndicate. His brother-in-law thought that Richard would do well as a merchant marine and signed him up as an apprentice seaman. Richard was hired very quickly as a crew member on a lake freighter. However, an emergency appendectomy sidelined that voyage as Richard recovered at his sister's home. After he felt better, his brother-in-law drove him to the National Maritime Union Hall and Richard filed paperwork for his Siemens card. Incidentally, the Union Hall is just one block east of the nurse's townhouse. But when Richard returned to the hall for the next few afternoons, he was not able to secure any more jobs at sea. Richard had no more money and his relatives in Illinois were hesitant to give him any more. And when Richard finally received an assignment on a ship, his spot was already taken when he arrived. Richard was homeless, penniless, and hungry. He took another $25 from a family member and rented a room for the night. He was also angry. He spent the rest of the day drinking at his usual taverns. It was there he spotted 53-year-old Ella Mae Hooper and followed her. He accosted Ella with a knife and forced her to go back to his room. There, Richard raped her and stole her 22 caliber pistol. Then, dressed all in black, Richard left the hotel and headed toward the nurse's townhouse. After he was arrested, Richard had sessions twice a week with Dr. Marvin Zapurin, who was the chief psychiatrist at the Cook County Jail. The doctor was very sympathetic with Richard, even saying that he was, quote, a very moral person, basically. Dr. Saporin believed that Richard was brain damaged as a child from multiple TBIs. He believed that when Richard drank and did drugs, he was not able to control his aggression. The combination of the brain damage and psychotropic substances caused the doctor to deem Richard Speck not responsible for his actions the night of the murders by reason of mental defect. You may be surprised at what I'm about to say, but I could not agree more. The doctor also believed that Richard suffered from, quote, the Madonna whore complex, which means that he saw women in absolute terms. They were either saintly or they were the opposite of that. For Richard, it appears that his mother and sisters and sisters-in-law fell into the saintly category and everybody else 
every other woman he met or dealt with fell into the other category and therefore deserved his scorn. But none of the doctor's observations or diagnoses were brought up in court. Both the defense and the prosecution refused to call him as a witness after they discovered that he was writing a book about Richard. And the week after the trial ended, Dr. Saporin was fired from his staff job at the prison. Nevertheless, I think Dr. Saporin's diagnosis was right on. And being a prison psychiatrist, he knew a psychopath when he saw one, a sociopath when he saw one, and someone who had mental defect. This is not to say, in my opinion, Richard was not responsible for his crimes. He was. But I believe he was compelled to commit those crimes because of his horrible upbringing and his damaged brain. Dr. Saporin might have been correct about the damage the multiple traumatic brain injuries had. After Richard's death in 1991, his brain was preserved for scientific research while the rest of his body was cremated. Scientists studying it noticed an abnormality in the hippocampal formations, the medial temporal lobe area involved in memory formation and located close to the amygdala. That controls mood and aggression. Other scientists that were consulted agreed that there might be structural abnormalities in both of those areas. They decided to send the brain to a doctor at Harvard, who was the foremost expert on the hippocampus in the world. The scientists stopped all work on the specimen so they would not damage it. They carefully prepared the package containing Speck's brain so that it would be safely shipped to Massachusetts. Their secretary placed the brain in a room with other packages for the courier to pick up, except that when the courier came, the packages, including the brain, had vanished. Yeah, you heard me. Someone stole Richard Speck's brain. If that was not what the thief was after, I'm sure it was quite a shock. So even in death, Richard Speck could not stay away from crime. Richard Speck was indicted on eight counts of murder. The state of Illinois stated that he, quote, intentionally and knowingly strangled five, stabbed two others, and stabbed and strangled one. On August 1st, 1966, Richard Speck's public defender entered a plea of not guilty. Richard refused to plead insanity. At a hearing on August 18th, 1966, Richard Speck's lawyer then requested an impartial panel of six psychiatrists representing both sides examine Richard Speck. Three would be chosen by the prosecution and three by the defense. On Tuesday, November 29th, three psychiatrists and a physician testified that Richard was competent to stand trial. They also maintained that he had not shown evidence of brain damage, even though his lawyer had said he abused drugs and alcohol and suffered head injuries as a child. Richard told the psychiatrist that he had been on a barbiturates and alcohol bender on the day and evening of the crime. And therefore, he could not remember anything from the day the nurses were killed. Richard's public defender argued that he was unable to get a fair trial in Chicago due to the negative publicity. The trial was transferred to Peoria, Illinois, about 165 miles south of Chicago. Richard's trial began on April 3rd, 1967. 
on April 15th, the jury began deliberations. It took them only 49 minutes to return with a guilty verdict for all eight murders. The judge sentenced Richard to die in the electric chair. He appealed, but his conviction and sentence were upheld. However, on June 28, 1971, Richard's luck changed. The United States Supreme Court upheld Speck's conviction, but reversed his death sentence on the grounds that more than 250 potential jurors were unconstitutionally excluded from his jury because of their objection to capital punishment. Richard was then sentenced to 400 to 1,200 years in prison, which was later reduced to 100 to 300 years. Two years after he was denied parole for the first time, Speck finally confessed the truth to a reporter from the Chicago Tribune. In December of 1991, Richard complained of chest pain and was taken to the prison hospital where he suffered a heart attack. He died on December 5th, 1991, one day short of his 50th birthday. But the public was not rid of Richard Speck yet. In 1996, a film was discovered that inmates had made at the correctional center where Richard was incarcerated. In the explicit video, Richard is seen doing drugs and having sex with other inmates. He also speaks about his brutal murders of the eight nurses. When asked by another inmate why he killed them, Richard told him that, quote, it just wasn't their day. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at Wondery.com slash survey. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Director of Research is Anne Blue. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Supervising audio producer, Maxwell Carney. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. With audio assistance from Katie Corpy and Matt Dyson. Editorial support, Alexander McCall. Host support from Allison Sandler. Renee Levesque is our production manager. Jada Williams is our production coordinator. Oscar Guido is the producer from Tree Fort Media. From Amazon Music and Wondery, producer is Stephanie Wachnin. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Tree Fort and Marsha Louie and Erin O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Tree Fort Media.